Good day, everyone. Welcome again to Community Day 2022. And my name is Bob Foreman. And with me today is Hugo Watanuki. We are both senior software engineers at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, and we're glad you could join us. Our talk today is called Journey to the Cloud and what every ECL developer should know and common misconceptions when using HPCC systems cloud native. Welcome aboard. So some of you have been aware of the cloud migration topic through either water cooler talk, if you're back at the office, or you've seen on our website talk of moving to the cloud, You've seen some blogs popping up on our HPCC site about moving to the cloud. And maybe your managers um, in your own particular companies and stuff have worked with um, discussing this. And so why is this a good thing? Why is there a big discussion about moving to the cloud? And it comes down to three big things. Moving to the cloud gives us better, number one, cost management execution, storage, file access. And my colleague Hugo is going to show you some of the new changes we've made to ECL Watch to allow you to manage cost more effectively, more efficiently. Number two, scalability, dynamic scalability. And you'll see uh, in this implementation of clouds that our services, our pods can ramp up and ramp down. We can add more nodes, if you will. We're calling them nodes, but there's uh, we're, we're going to be discussing the terminology here moving to the cloud. But there's going to be a much more dynamic fit of the type of data that you're working with and the types of jobs that you're running. When you need more memory, you'll get it. When you need more memory for storage, you'll also get it. So it's dynamically scalable. And number three, flexibility. There's a plethora of configuration options that help you fit whatever job you're going to be running. And whatever group you're in, whether you're in data engineering or whether you're in the query group or whatever you're doing with your own business, um, there's um, unlimited flexibility with movement to the cloud. So in our talk, we when we were first asked to do this, we, I went out and approached a lot of the people working uh, on everyday production jobs. And so there were several questions that came to mind that they were uh, posing to us. And number one, what are the new roles that you might be facing? All right. So um, how, are, how is your job as an ECL developer going to change? Are you going to have any new responsibilities, any new roles that you're going to be taking on um, by, by this movement to the cloud? Number two, how much code will be needed to be refactored or rewritten? That's the most important question that came to mind for me as an ECL developer and as an ECL trainer. Of course, you know, training, training uh, ECL with, 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 with the different classes that we have and the different clusters that we ramp up. We are actually using cloud implementation for a lot of our classes right now. And then how did that affect our training code? How much did we need to refactor or rewrite? Are there any new responsibilities for me personally as a developer? Well, there will be. There'll be some things that you do locally. Uh, for example, when you want to do some proof of concept testing on your own local machine, the concept of the virtual machine has been de deprecated somewhat, and the new implementation of a local Kubernetes cluster has been implemented. And I'm going to show you all about that in our talk today. So these questions and many more will be answered in this talk. All right, so before we dive into the meat of the material, here's the big secret. From an ECL developer standpoint, most of your daily roles and responsibilities will change very little or possibly none at all. So take a deep breath, relax. We're gonna take you through some of the change, things that will change, but the most part, for the most part, your job as an ECL developer, the same responsibilities, the same diligence that you have with writing good ECL code will still be maintained in the cloud. And there won't be a lot of new things that you'll have to worry about as far as um, from an ECL developer standpoint. And there won't be a lot of refactoring or rewriting of code. All right, very little. 
So with that in mind, I'm going to turn over to my partner, Hugo. He's going to talk now for a little bit now about um, the concept of moving from bare metal to containers. And then he's going to talk about some of the things that will be changing in our cloud uh, native environment. So Hugo, welcome. Take it away, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction here. So um, I'm glad that you properly set up the expectations for the ECL developers um, worldwide. So now that we are all more relaxed and have a clear picture of what the overall impact of the cloud migration might have upon us, uh, we can start focusing on the nitty gritty details of um, specific areas where we actually might see some change. Okay. So remember, even though this is not, uh, this is a significant change in terms of technology, technological paradigm, uh, the way the HPC systems components have been designed for the cloud, thing to make things uh, transparent somewhat for the ECL developer, okay? Now, even though this is not a talk dedicated to um, explain what a cloud migration is, by the way, this topic was extensively covered uh, in previous uh, summits, and I encourage everyone to watch those recordings if not already done so. It is still perhaps a good idea to recap some uh, core concepts behind what's involved on the migration, uh, just so we can properly understand the impact that it might have on our code. So Bob is showing here on, on this slide to start with, one of the first or the main key difference we need to have in mind. So the cluster ar architecture will change. We are going from a bare metal uh, concept to a containerized concept. Okay, so that's the first change. Now, when you look at the bare metal deployments, we used to be very tied uh, or bounded to a physical hardware, a physical storage, for instance, right? That's not the case anymore, right? In the cloud-based deployments, our focus is much more on containers that can be uh, organized into pods, which in turn are managed by a Kubernetes cluster, all right? And the cloud deployments uh, also have a more diversified selection of storage options. So we will no longer be just talking about local physical storage, okay? Keep that in mind. So the key message here on this brief recap is for you to think in the cloud in terms of services, okay? Uh, each interfacing component as a service. Okay, so let's now get started by looking at some of these changes, right? Now, this slide here uh, was a result of a, um, a very good, very nice exercise we did, Bob and I did with some of our colleagues on the HPCC systems platform team and the solutions team. And the idea here is to list some of the changes perhaps in the order that most of the ECL developers might, might see them when you first start developing ECL code in a cloud native uh, deployment of HPCC systems, okay? So uh, first, first item there, Bob, uh, whenever your organization decides to move your HPC systems infrastructure to the cloud, and depending on how legacy components are reutilized, you might or might not see a difference on the ACL Watch server host name or IP address. This is, will now be dependent on the a specific strategy uh, being used for, for, for the migration, but keep in mind that it might be possible or you will be provided a new ECL watch URL for login. Um, this, this will be properly communicated with, within each team as the migration occurs, including making the appropriate changes to your ECL ID or VS code settings, okay? And speaking of that, you can continue to choose uh, or to use any client interface tool such as the ECL IDE and command line ECL or even VS code all these should work the same way as they do with a bare metal deployment, okay? Just point to the appropriate service instance now. Second bullet item that Bob is highlighting there um, and start moving into ECL code itself. One area you might also see some changes is in regard to the cluster handling libraries, okay? So 
Since these libraries are essentially related to providing information about specific HPCC systems clusters um, that you are connected to, some of them either will have a different meaning or even have no meaning once we migrate to the cloud. Simply because most of the time we are no longer directly referring to a physical machine, but instead we are referring to service APIs, okay? So for instance, uh, right there, Bob, if you put the first uh, library, uh, Tor lib node and the next one, Tor lib nodes, will now refer to the worker number and the total number of nodes you have on your Kubernetes cluster, okay? On top of which your HPCC systems cluster is running on. So you will still be able to reference them to build logic on, it, on your ECL code. Now that one Bob just highlighted, the Tor lib group, that's one that may be no longer be applicable because the concept of node group is no longer uh, applicable in the topology of the um, HPCC systems clusters running in Kubernetes. So although the library function is still available for usage, especially for those still using the, the bare metal version, you might need to think or rethink its usage if you're running the cloud, okay? Next one there, Bob, finally, if you have references to DALI, or if you're using to reference to DALI using the Torlib DALI server uh, function, that library or that function will now provide you the internal IP and port number for the My DALI service. Okay, so instead of information from the physical machine, you are getting the the information from the service. But again, this should not be a problem because in the cloud your code will naturally be less dependent on the DALI information as we might see a little bit further, okay? Moving into the next section, uh, the same idea here apply, applies to some of the ESP topology services that are currently available in the bare metal version. So since in the cloud native version, HPCC systems has a dynamic topology, in the sense that most of the service components are instantiated on a as needed basis. Some of the topology services that are associated uh, to static components uh, or component information no longer have a meaning in the cloud. So right there are a couple of examples, TP machine info, TP get component file, uh, those are no longer or might no longer be useful for you, okay? Now, very important there, few seconds ago, I also briefly mentioned that the fact that in the cloud version or the cloud native uh, environment, the ECL programmer tends to be less dependent on the DALI information. And one of the reasons uh, I was mentioning that is because the access and reference to remote files, uh, which is usually where we reference remote DALIs, uh, will now be implemented via a an ESP service instead of relying directly on DALI. So uh, Bob, if you click on the next one, that's the name of the ESP service. And therefore, the way we reference remote files will now include a reference to the service name of the remote ESP service, just like it's being highlighted um, in yellow right there. And I personally feel this is a very nice implementation or improvement, if you will, okay? I also added this as well. Uh, things that will change is um, in progress right now are there's a lot of developers that have had their code on GitLab mm -hmm. and there has been a um, big move of GitLab to GitHub and some of it's already been done, but some of it's already in progress. But to some of our external uh, people using uh, outside of LexisNexis, this is something that uh, we've already been doing internally uh, with our own group. And it might be something that all of you um, might also consider moving to the more standard um, and more um, powerful GitHub versus GitLab. All right. All right, so now that we have touched it on a, on a very important point um, here, file management, uh, I guess that's the area where we as ECL developers might, note, might notice most of the changes when migrating to the cloud. Uh, and that's basically because we need to sometimes reference at the code level remote directories or operations that uh, bring data into and out of uh, our HPCC systems clusters. And I'm referring to um, 
operations like spray and, and despray, right? Uh, well, I'm not saying that the core functionality will change, but basically because we need to be mindful that we are no longer referencing local physical components when we refer to elements such as the landing zone that Bob is highlighting there. Uh, instead, we are using centralized cloud locations, for instance, via storage plans. So let's take a look at some uh, examples extracted from the new ECL watch V9 interface that illustrates some of the possible scenarios uh, as to how you could refer to the remote directories or even spray or despray operations via uh, the standard file library functions, okay? So in the left there, you can see that the uh, landing zone, uh, the, 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 the landing zone from that cluster has been set up using the full naming conventions. So we are using my drop zone and local host. So if you need to reference this location to access a file or to spray or despray files to this cluster at the ECL code level, this is how you would be referencing the landing zone elements as part of your function library calls. So right there, you have the remote directory and the next map image uh, will show you how to uh, e-spray and despray files referencing um, the, the, the landing zone on the on your cluster, okay? Remember, this is just an illustration of a potential uh, or default scenario. Your organization might decide to utilize a different naming convention. So remember to always double check your own cluster settings whenever you need to perform those operations, okay? okay. All right, next slide there, Bob. Um, now that we have seen the changes on the spray and this spray functions belonging to the STD file libraries, Remember, uh, we can also display, display and display using DF, DFU uh, plus client tool. So <clears throat> even though this might not be a common scenario for most ECL developers, bear in mind that the landing zone elements that we just discussed in the previous slide also need to be taken into consideration um, here, right? So uh, there are two new options that are, have been included on the DFE, the DFU Plus command line. Uh, one is the source plan or SRC plan, basically the source storage plane containing the source file you want to ex you want to spray. And the next and the second one is uh, destination plan or DST plan, mm. basically the destination storage plane uh, of, of where you want to display your file to. Okay, and here are two uh, examples of how you can spray and despray. Th these are two common lines, and I'm just highlighting uh, the sections where uh, those two new parameters are being added. Notice that um, whenever you use both new options, you no longer need to reference the source and destination IP options, as again, they are no longer meaningful in the cloud. But just, case, just in case you were wondering, the server parameter you see at the end of both command lines there, they are referring to the external IP address and port of the ECL watch service running in a HPC systems Kubernetes cluster, okay? Very well, on the next slide, um, I want you to highlight two items or starting with this slide, two items that might not be considered ECL code changes or even changes per se, because I don't think we have quite similar features available today in the bare metal clusters, but you might consider using them going forward, given their easy of access, if you will. One of the items is uh, cost information. So you can now access cost information for your work units and files, yes. So in a cloud paradigm, as Bob mentioned in the introduction of this talk, cost management becomes more effective. So now we can also have access to the, to the execution costs associated to our work units, like Bob is, is showing right there. And on the, next on the next image, you can also see the um, storage costs for your logical files. So basically, uh, there are three costs that, that are being um, um, displayed on ECL Watch 9. Execution cost, 
basically pertaining the cost of executing the work unit, graph and subgraph on the Tor cluster. It also includes uh, um, what's required to uh, comply your job as well. Uh, file access cost, which is the second column right there uh, on the image you're seeing, is the cost regarding uh, reading and writing um, of the logical file, as many storage plans have a separate charge for data operations. And the cost information you are seeing on the logical file name is the cost of actually hosting the, the data in the storage plane, okay? Now, very interesting there, you, you can now even implement uh, a new compiler directive via hashtag option that is referred to as uh, job gu guillotine, right? Guillotine, just yes. To, yeah, <laughs> just to limit the cost associated to the work unit um, in case a work unit goes beyond a certain threshold you might be willing to set up. So you might see some messages in the ACL watch panel like, like the one we are highlighting there. Pretty cool in my opinion. Yeah. And well, the cost management could be a, set, a talk uh, itself. So if you are willing to uh, get some more details around cost management, very interesting blog available in our website, okay? So, and, and the, the second item in the next slide is basically uh, something that you might be interested or not. So if you have the habit of looking at your cluster components, looking at log files, be aware that uh, in ECL Watch 9, you have a new topology section where, where, where you can see not only the status of your HPC system spots and services uh, from the Kubernetes cluster uh, you are running on, but also you can have access to the raw logs from these components, okay? So left, I'm showing you how you can access the pods and services. On the light, uh, right side, you can see how you can access the logs going forward, all right? Beautiful. Very well. So this is the last slide in terms of the core aspects we think might be important for an ECL developer um, to know when, when you migrate to the cloud. If you have any questions, please remember to post your questions on the chat. We are all here to support you um, for any additional queries or elements you, you, you might want to discuss. Now, uh, Bob, um, I think it's time for us to come back to the uh, part where we can show how the developers can now become more familiar and practice some of the aspects we just covered, but now in a sandbox environment. So feel free to take over. Absolutely. Thank you, Hugo. All right. So um, first of all, in your journey to getting familiar with cloud native, there's several resources already available to help get you started. Uh, first of all, number one, and this go out and get the documentation on containerized HPCC systems platform. Uh, this is the holy grail of all the information that you need to learn, study, uh, and get familiar with the process of building your own and maintaining and working with containerized HPCC system platform. All right. Also, I have, uh, as of a couple months ago, put together a online lesson to actually walk you through the creation of a local containerized HPCC cluster. So if you, if you had visited our introduction to ECL class part one in the past, Go back there, there's some new lessons, and these lessons are all, by the way, are always getting updated, and there will be more updates coming in the next couple of months to reflect the new ECL watch that Hugo pointed out to you. So um, we are in progress of those. These, these online lessons are dynamic, always growing, always changing as HPCC changes as well. All right. And then last but not least is the amazing HPCC Wiki. When I stumbled on this, I went like, wow, this was a, an effort of love put together of putting all the cloud resources together over the past couple of years, different presenters, different documentation, different techniques. So here is the link to the HPCC Wiki and a getting started page on using the cloud native platform. And also, I should mention to you, they also point to a number of blogs. And just like like Hugo had mentioned, uh, uh, Shamser's uh, blog on cost control 
and some other beautiful things that uh, from Gavin Halliday on uh, some cloud things. That This is where we got most of our information for this presentation. All right, so you've got all those resources and now you're ready. All right, you wanna actually start to dive into the cloud and get to learn it on your own. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about creating a local Kubernetes cluster, just a quick start guide here. Well, first of all, number one, you gotta get Docker, all right? So you installed Docker, I like Docker Desktop for Windows, that's my platform. And as you see, there is my copy of Docker that's currently running right now. Uh, the other thing to mention is Docker is not open source. So you need to get um, an account, a, a business account established. All risk uh, solution um, people at LexisNexis have their own account. Um, external people, of course, um, if you have a, a large company, you'll have to talk about that, negotiate that. If it's just you working on HPCC as a um, academic pro uh, project or something, well, you have the free student account that you can download Docker and use. So after you've installed Docker, whoops, then you go and number two, enable Kubernetes, which is inside of Docker. So you just go to the settings. There's a checkbox there that says enable Kubernetes. That's how easy it is. All right, number three, you're going to be installing Helm. And there's um, in my lesson, my online lesson, there is a link to installing Helm and how to do that. And once you've got Helm installed on your local machine, you then will go into, well, I like to use PowerShell. I'm going to show you that. And the documentation that I also mentioned in the resources will show you Step number one, you'll add the HPCC repository to your local Helm chart. And then um, before you launch your cluster, you'll update the Helm repo. There's a command to do that. It's very simple. Helm repo update. All right. After that, you'll enable persistent storage for your local deployment. So in other words, what I'm saying here is your landing zone and your queries and your logical file storage will all happen locally on your machine. It's so cool. It's kind of so transparent now. You'll set up your own folders for landing zone. You'll set up your own folders for your uh, logical file storage and query storage and your ECL work units. Everything is transparent. Everything is there. And the cool thing then too, is when I want to update data on my local cluster for, for testing, all I do now is copy the file to that folder location that's on my, uh, at the designated target. And I don't have to upload using the ECL watch anymore. So it's kind, kind of a cool thing, kind of a little like benefit of using the local quick start cluster. So then you launch your cluster and enjoy and have all kinds of fun. So you'll see right here, I'm gonna, um, uh, first of all, I've, um, I've well, let me just jump jump back to this previous slide here. I have a, a slide, I have a cluster running right now. And you can see as I zoom in on this, it's localhost 127.001. And if you look at my cluster, it looks like any cluster that you've been working with. I'm using the old ECL watch, but there's the tech preview for the new ECL watch. So that's also built into your local Kubernetes cluster. All right, just to show you that. And then here is all of my ECL work units that I've worked with locally. Here is my local file storage. Here is my landing zones. So it's just like any, any cluster that you work with, except everything is stored locally. And you can see here, I can jump over to my um, file explorer and actually show you where all this stuff lives. I actually have an a external drive that I use um, off you know, I have an external drive here and in my external drive. So I've got a D colon and I've got a folder I've created called HPCC data. And this is the first step when you create local storage, you'll create a location. It could be on your C drive, on a D drive, any other drive that you want, but you point to it. You create these folders, Dolly storage, debug, drop zone, HPCC data, queries, and Sasha. And so you create that. Once you launch it, all right, so let me just back out of this real quick. So then I like to use PowerShell. And the thing I like about PowerShell, it's kind of like you can, um, you have 
a kind of a paper trail of what you've been doing. So this morning I came in and I wanted to ramp up my cluster. And the first thing I did was I went ahead to um, just make sure that my Helm repo was in sync. So you see there, I've got a Helm um, update repo and um, help Helm repo update. And it said, happy Helming and go for it. And then I did a search repo, which I'll be showing you, showed me my latest version. I did a Docker pull to pull the latest version. And this doesn't have to be done. The Docker pull normally is automatic, but sometimes I do it just to, uh, just kind of, I, I don't know. I just, uh, sometimes if there's a problem with a remote location, like some of, some of our colleagues in India, um, when they've, they've had trouble launching a cluster because there's been trouble with the Docker communicating with the, with the um, uh, Docker server to pull these, these images down. So you can manually pull them down before you launch them. I just think it's a good technique. I like to do that. And then I wanted to show you, uh, scrolling down a little bit further, my launching of my local file. So you see right here, um, right in the center of the screen there, Helm install HPCC local file. And I actually, when I did that, it created a text file, text group here that I literally copied this information from storage on down and built it in a file called mystorage.yaml. All right. So as I launched my local storage plane, I create this file called mystorage.yaml that's in my root of my Helm folder where I synchronized and created my Helm repo. And then this was the execution of my cluster. So it was, um, once again, it was Helm install, name of my cluster, my HPCC, what version I specified, 8.8, .8, setting my global image to the core version where you have other options like GNN and GNN uh, GPU, and then my storage YAML to tell the cluster where my local storage is located. All right, and so as I launched it, I started to query and see how things were going. And so I love this. This is kind of a snapshot of what was going on. 19 seconds in, it started to create my containers. A little further in, 44 seconds, I checked it again. Some were running, some were still creating. And then finally, I got to a couple more here. And eventually, after several checks, I got that one little last little pod that was getting created. And finally, I got to the point where everything was up and running within 100 seconds. All right. Then I did a check of get services. And this told me my ECL watch externally could be found by accessing local host. So that's why I'm using 127.001.8. 8010. And then here is uh, a description of the uh, persistent volume claim and what's loaded. This is good for troubleshooting also, just to show you that things are bound properly and running properly. All right. And then logs. All right. So I'm, I'm jumping ahead of the stuff here. Let me get back to the slides here now and run through a lot of this stuff that I just did. Here is the Helm repo update commands where we... Um, I just simply um, use the search for what was the latest version. All right. I, I Actually, that slide was a little older. I was using 8.86, but I launched this morning 8.8.8. .8. This was my Docker pull command where I just pulled down the Docker images so that everything was my Helm, local Helm repo was in sync and ready to launch. And then here was the launching of my local storage where I just simply launched my old local storage. I copied the contents on the right here to a new file called mystorage.yaml. And then I launched that, um, actually launched that, which I'm not showing it here. Should have added that slide. So that was, uh, well, so once I, yeah, I, I guess I should have put that in there. Uh, so my launch, which was, let me go back over to the, um, I should have added that in my slide there. That's That's kind of important. So if you don't launch it, there's my launch command once again. All right. And this is in the documentation and in my online lessons. So once again, I launched my install and my version number and the type of cluster I was launching and then the MyStorage YAML. All right.
just notice that. <laughs> All right. So here is once I launched it, then I checked my cluster status. And that was the get pods command that was telling me what was up and running and the name of the pods, the um, get services that were up and running and their internal IPs you never use. They're just there for reference. It's the external IP addresses and the ports that are of note for you. And then the PVC persistent volume claim where you can see what is bound properly. And that's important because I want to show you. One time I was launching a cluster and my cluster was hanging and I couldn't figure out what was going on there. And so I started to troubleshoot here. I said, get pods. And then I saw the, the pods that were not launching that were still kind of hung, um, which they were um, either in pending mode or container creating. It was just having trouble starting and running. So I actually got the name of the pod, uh, put the put the name in, described the pod with the pod name, and then I got a message here. And it said here, persistent volume claim not found. And for some reason, I had bumped my machines. Uh, my external drive uh, was not connected properly. And so it was unable to find my storage. So that was a simple fix. I then went back in, made sure my D drive was connected properly, ran everything, and then everything was up and running. So again, uh, just as a quick note of a guy who has started these clusters a lot now, number one, make sure you have the latest Docker images, make sure you're launching the right versions, make sure that your storage location is active and ready, make sure your folders are all proper. And it's just like driving a car. You know, I could throw you the, you know, we could throw you the keys and, and, uh, but you need to learn how to drive a little bit. You need to know the, the internals of uh, these local clusters. And that was my goal here of uh, part of this talk here. All right. So we're going to wrap up this talk. That's it. Uh, my local cluster, like I said, again, you know, it's up and running there. I do want to show one more thing. Um, Here's another ECL watch that I've got up and running right now. And you might notice if you zoom in on this, it might be one cluster that all of you are familiar with. It's our play cluster, play.hpccsystems.com. And you can see here that we have some ECL work units out there and we have a landing zone. Uh, we have logical files and so on. And so, yeah, it's a cluster, but guess what? This cluster is a cloud native cluster. It is running on the cloud. And you really, you could tell by looking at some, like the cluster itself says data instead of the word Thor. Um, there's kind of little hints that you have after working with these for several months, you'll start to see, oh, I'm working on a cloud cluster because just some of the naming conventions are a little bit different. And like Hugo said, um, the topology too, you'll see, you'll be able to, Go into the topology in the new ECL watch and look at pods and look at logs and everything from that point. So then you'll know you're running on the cloud. But the URL doesn't really tell you that, does it? It doesn't say, hey, I'm a cloud cluster. No, it's play.hpccsystems.com. Excuse me. All right. So let's wrap up here. We've got a few minutes left here. I've, let's talk about a Q&A session. Um, and I'm we're going to just go back and forth here. Hugo's going to ask the questions, and I'm going to be like the great Karnak of the old Johnny Carson late night show, and I will give you the answers. I, I think that's actually backwards. Karnak used to give the answers, and then um, he was given the answers, and then he uh, gave the questions. So we're going a little backwards here. Anyway, I'm rambling. Hugo, how about question number one? Let's get started. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, let's get started with some questions from Roxy folks, right? They might be concerned here. So first... Um, uh, first question, how can I compile a query in uh, on a containerized or cloud-based system? Hmm, let me think about that. Well, same way as bare metal, Hugo, command line or with the IDE or from the ECL watch, just point to your HPCC systems in instance to compile using the same ECL command line tool, ECL deploy. You can even use the ECL watch to deploy your cluster like we mentioned, but you can also use a command line tool. Perfect. Uh, well, second question around Roxy yet. Um, how do I copy queries from an on-site cluster to Azure now? All right, that's again, pretty simple. The copy query command, use the, but instead use the Azure host name or IP address for the target. 
Um, there's a couple of um, changes to using the path. And then, but simply, once again, from the command line, ECL queries and the copy command, your source and your target, and then the activate flag as an option. Perfect. And now that we start talking about IP addresses and that kind of stuff, so number three, how can I get the IP address for the Azure target cluster? There you go. Well, you, you can first of all use the Kubi, if you have access, you can use the Kubi control get service command, use the external IP address listed for the ECL watch. That, that um, services command that I showed you earlier that showed local host in my example, right? So get uh, SVC. Right. And number four right there, uh, do we have to have, do we have to use the DNS name or do we need to use the IP address at all? That's a good question. If you can reach the ECL watch with the DNS name, then it should also work for the command line. All right. And then going back to that core question, how can I find the ECL watch or Dali host name if I wanted to? Well, just like we we're finding it now, you know, normally the system administrator is going to give you that information. So as an ECL developer, they're going to give you not only the ECL watch information, they're also going to give you account access because these will be security protected as well. You'll need a username. You'll need a password to log into a lot of these clusters because we're working with uh, a lot of personal data in many cases. So the cluster will be prevented, will be protected uh, with security protocols. Perfect. I think that takes us to the last Roxy uh, question at least. So how do I publish a query? All right, great question. Uh, same way again as bare metal, command line. Uh, on the command line, you can use the ECL publish or use the ECL watch to publish, just like we do right now to publish a query. All, All right. right. Yep. Now, you All right, there, and I'm sorry, there's an example right there at the bottom, ECL publish. And then the, the, the Ruxy cluster. The other thing that's not shown here is the server name. Um, so some, you have to sometimes put the server, uh, I think that's the, the, the slash S switch to, to the, the particular server that you're publishing to. So you the, I'm, uh, trust me that there's a lot of developers that are watching this um, and listening to our, our talk today that know a lot more about this than we do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, Getting a little bit into the sysadmin mm -hmm. stuff, uh, if I want to check some logs, even as a programmer, how do I check the logs? All right, uh, checking the logs. Well, there's a command here called Kubernetes logs with the name of the pod. Um, actually, I'm going to jump over to my ECL watch, uh, not the ECL watch, but my command line tool again. I was actually kind of uh, playing with this a little bit earlier. Um, there, It's actually a log command. Let's see, where am I at here? Uh, there it is. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I issued a command here. Uh, that was described nodes. Let's see. Let me go up a little bit farther. There we are. All right. So Kubi control log and then the name of the pod that I was looking for the log for. And it gave me right in PowerShell. Some of the, this was before I was doing anything on the cluster. So again, it, it was you know, tracking down the time and some of the messages that were being uh, sent. All right, so yeah, this command does work. I verified it this morning when I was uh, running on my own local cluster. Perfect. All right, now how do I get data onto Azure, right? All right, again, the copy query command or copy or add to the package map, all right, with data copy, and by the way, all these Q and A's are going to be in a document that we have uh, in our chat. You should be able to download this. Uh, this is available to everybody. So we're just kind of uh, going over that, but you can have this hard copy of these questions and answers for your reference. Right. All right. You can also use the ECL watch as well as the copy query command. Perfect. Now, number nine, how can I start basic HPC systems cloud cluster like the old VirtualBox image? I think that's an easy one for you. <laughs> I know. I think I ran that one into the ground, didn't I, Hugo? Yeah. Using Docker Desktop or Azure or any cloud provider and install your HPC systems cloud native Helm charts. By the way, I'll say something else. Um, some of our machine learning uh, gurus out there, Roger Dev, Louis Zhu, they also like to use um, Hyper-V. And they take Hyper-V and they actually create um, a VM for Ubuntu. 
and then they build an HPCC cluster right from within the Ubuntu VM. And so that's another option. If you don't want to use Docker Desktop or Azure or a cloud cloud solution, you can still go back and use our Hyper-V manager that's still supported. But again, I, I, um, I, I've, I've used that. I just kind of prefer, since I've used Docker Desktop so much, I kind of prefer this, this uh, method right here. True. And just, just a quick comment here as well, Bob, if, you, if people are wondering from where those questions came from, it's a combination. People provided input from the business area. So these, these questions actually reflect real doubts coming from, from the ECL users. So yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So number 10 there, quite complex one, using the example Terraform uh, modules on Azure, an ECL watch error prevents my instance from starting. How do I handle that? Yeah, this was a troubleshooting question. Um, to set your auto launch of the ECL watch to false, disable the automatic launch. So people using Terraform, um, I think, Hugo, you've had some more experience with this than I have. And so this is just kind of a uh, nice troubleshooting tip to know, know of if you're having trouble uh, starting your ECL, excuse me, your ECL watch. True. Uh, next, number 11, how can I see how many resources each node in my Kubernetes cluster has? Yeah, and then there was a command here called describe nodes. Um, I actually had tested that this morning. So there was my log down here. Um, here was, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, Kubernetes described nodes. You know, and by the way, um, Kubernetes is very, um, if you type in the wrong command, it will tell you, um, mm, I didn't recognize that command. Maybe instead of describes, you should have typed describe. So right. yeah. So there's my Kubernetes described nodes, and here was the result of that. So you see all of the information. I like this memory pressure, disk pressure, PID pressure, and my cluster is fine. My Kubelet has sufficient memory, has no disk pressure, sufficient PID, and Kubernetes is ready. All right, so okay. these are things I like to see. Good. Uh, well, almost getting closer to the end here, but how can yeah. I see which values my cloud instance is using? Yeah, now this one, this one I had a little uh, trouble starting this morning. And then um, after Hugo and I were working together with this, um, the answer is kind of specific. The get values will display any changes from the default values.yaml that was issued. So if there's no changes in your value, you will not get any result or giving an error that says the resource is not available. But if there is a change in your values YAML, it will reflect that accordingly. Perfect. And then getting getting to the final question here for, for those who are mystic, we're, we're, we have their <laughs> questions. So how can I execute a comment on a specific pod? All right, well, here's the um, lingo for that. Use the Kubernetes. EXEC execute pod and then the specific command. So here's an example of that. So we're executing a command on the ECLCC server. Uh, if more affectionately, some people, uh, that's our compiler and our linker and a uh, particular command line switch here to uh, perform some kind of operation. All Perfect. right. And then also, if you need to find the name of your pod, again, once again, as a review, use kubi control git pods to find the pod ID you are looking for awesome well that takes us to the end of our cloud journey our journey to the cloud and what every ecl developer should know hopefully we've given you a nice uh, information trip here of things that um, you need to be aware of and um you know this wouldn't have been possible without a bunch of talented individuals that i want to give kudos for right now jim defabia um <laughs> Kind of, <laughs> you know, I've practiced his last name so much. Panagiatatos. All right. I'm just going to step on it. I'm sorry, Greg. Apologies for that. Um, and uh, but Greg and Jim, uh, the documentation masters for the great Q&A on containerized clusters. Also, the uh, Q&A that we just went through, they helped to put that together and formulate a lot of those questions. Um, this talk wouldn't have been possible without verifying with our HPCC Mavericks, Richard Chapman, Gavin Halliday, and Jake Smith, 
for fact checking, quality control, and troubleshooting tips. They were great. Shamsar Ahmed for a great blog on cloud cost savings using ECL Watch. And my good friend and colleague who've been working with ECL um, since almost its start, Greg Whitaker, and all of the developers on that team who provided the hard questions and inspiration for this talk. And thank you all very much. And that's it for our, our talk. So we'll open the floor for questions in the time we have remaining. Thank you for listening and please enjoy the rest of our conference. Hugo, yeah, anything to say? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. See you.